Hi, this is Keisha here with and this is Augustine. Augustine. Yep. <laughs> and this is Help for Mothers, Health, Education, Love, and Protection. We have a wonderful guest with us today, Lori Mihalik Levin, and she wrote the book Back to Work After Baby, How to Plan and Navigate a Mindful Return from Maternity Leave. Just let that sink in because it sounds amazing. I love the name. I love the idea. We're going to hear more about it, her journey to that place. She's also an attorney like myself, which I really find interesting that she's able to wear both of these hats. So let's hear from Lori. Yeah, welcome. Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Augustine and Keisha. It's really a pleasure to be here. I am in Washington, D.C., where I live. I am mama to two wonderful redheaded boys who are seven and nine at this point. They're in second and fourth grade doing the 100% virtual school thing right now in the midst of COVID. And I wear two hats professionally. I am partner at a law firm uh, where I practice Medicare regulatory law on a 50% schedule. I'm here talking to you today because of the other 50% of my my professional work week, where I run a program called Mindful Return that helps new parents transition back to work after parental leave in a much more calm and empowered way. That's so exciting. I love this, this passion project, which I imagine it was, and somewhat personal. Tell us the story. Yeah, it was very, very personal <laughs> and um, also did start as one blog post and a passion project. Basically, I returned to work full time at a trade association after I had my first son, and I found it really challenging. And then two years after that, I had my second son. And, you know, in our house, we like to say that one plus one felt like 85, and nobody was sleeping, and I was going off the rails. And, um, you know, there was mom after mom in my office who would come into, come into my office, shut the door, and burst into tears. And we'd all talk about why or how this transition back after leave was so challenging, and why there were no resources to support us in the transition. You know, I could... I could find articles out there on the web that advised me not to put a photo of my kids on my desk or, you know, said that I might leak on my shirt when I came back, but I couldn't find anything that truly spoke to me and that was thoughtful and was really about that identity transition that happens when you become, you know, you, you transition from working person to working parent. So I really set out to create what I wished had existed for myself and endeavored to create this four-week online program for new parents that I've been running for six years now. So it started off just, you know, me working 20 minutes a night on it on the evenings and weekends and has transitioned into something much bigger. That's so exciting and so needed. I remember when I was a new mom, I read this article that said, you can't breastfeed by email. Like that was the title of the article. And I was like, duh. Uh, <laughs> you know, like wow. that's the worst piece of advice I ever got. And 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 there really have been such few resources. Tell us a little bit about what's included in this type of a course. Like, what are you offering that goes beyond what people can find in a Google search? Yeah, so a couple of things. I think the most important aspect is the cohort-based nature of it. So for me, when I was going off the rails, I took this online program called the Abundant Mama Project abundantmama.com. It's a great website, great blog. And I was connected to 100 other women from all over the globe who are not just working parents, but you know, just moms in general who were all struggling. And there was so much solace for me in being able to hear that, oh my gosh, me too, from all the people in the course. And so I intentionally designed the Mindful Return program to bring together moms. And now we also have a dad version of the course who are all going through the transition back to work after having a baby at the same time and can support one another. So in addition to course content, and you know, there is fantastic content and I brought in experts on a number of different areas where I wasn't the expert to write lessons, you know, in the areas uh, where they were expert, for example, a perinatal mental health specialist wrote the lesson about anxiety and, and so forth. But th the content is, I think, top quality and the stuff that I didn't find out there, but it's really the gel of it is the community and really being able to get to know other working parents. That is such a gel. I agree. In the work that I do, I prefer group process, group think. Yeah. 
Yeah. I love that. So tell us the process, like how they get in touch with you. They, they, they join a cohort based on when they're due or like, how does that work? Yeah. Uh, great question. So there's a cohort that starts every other month. So it should align with, you know, roughly the time when they're starting to feel anxious about going back to work. And, you know, you can just sign up for it online, mindfulreturn.com forward slash E dash course, you know, is our e-course and you sign up for the cohort and then, you know, on the day that the course starts, you get access to the first lesson and, you know, each weekday over four weeks, you get additional content through a private portal and these chat uh, boards, basically, where you're messaging back and forth with everybody in the course. And most of the new moms, about two thirds of the new moms actually take it while they're out on parental leave, on maternity leave. Um, and I think, you know, I have always have a handful of, I call them the overeager type A's who want to know what's going to happen, who are pregnant and take it. And about a third of the people take it after they've gone back to work and they're like, oh, this is actually really hard and I didn't know I needed help. Um, but most people, I think their anxiety really starts to ramp up about maybe midway through their leave and they start saying, oh gosh, like the countdown is on. I'm going to go back. I don't really know how this is going to work. I'm getting scared. You know, help. I don't know how all of this is going to shake out. So um, I think that's probably the best time to take the course because that's when the realities of having a baby have set in, you, you really get what it means to not have sleep and, you know, feel like you need to put yourself together professionally to go back. And you're probably dealing with that jumble of emotions, the excitement and potentially really looking forward to adult conversation and intellectual stimulation. And on the other hand, like desperately, perhaps not wanting to leave your baby. So, you know, it I is think it's such a, it's a hard process. Place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a hard place. I bet you've heard some really, really challenging stories. All the time, right? Um, yeah. I mean, the challenges range from, in the United States, we have this, you know, lack of good parental leave policies. So people who are six weeks postpartum having to go back into the office, and, you know, even that is generous compared to the I hate the word generous, but you know, the national average is that a woman has two weeks in the US, which is ridiculous, to really dealing with having to exclusively pump and travel and find the right childcare and childcare falling through. In, in Washington, DC, um, we have these ridiculous wait lists for daycare centers. You know, this was pre COVID, and I suspect post COVID, there are going to be even fewer spots. But basically, we as a family, got our names on the wait lists for daycare the day I found out I was pregnant. And even then I had to lobby them in order to get off of these like years long wait lists. So it's pretty insane. That is insane. That yeah. is extreme. Yes. Whoa. Yeah. And the cost of childcare is ridiculous. So yeah, the challenges are numerous. <laughs> Well, can we go a little bit sort of current events right now um, based on your extensive market research and your understanding of the challenge now with less school options and more parents staying home? What does the transition look like now? Yeah, so the transition back to work after baby right now, often in many of the women, you know, the cases of the women I'm working with, looks like the baby is in the next room <laughs> and is crying and you're trying to sit at a computer and get your work done and all those emotions and feelings and hormones and all of that are telling you to run to your baby but you know you're now sitting in an office a home office trying to navigate going back Sometimes you know with no other child care provider right like no other, yeah we have both. no child care <laughs> exactly yeah right um, and so, you know, people are sort of passing baby off between significant others or joining pods and bringing in grandma. Um, we have neighbors here in DC who literally, not brand new parents, but they literally just left for a few months to go be with their parents in another state because, you know, they, they need that support. There are also silver linings, right? I hear from the brand new moms that they didn't have to pass their baby off to a stranger, that they don't have to pump. They can just go feed their baby. You know, that there are sweet things too that, you know, I'm really trying to encourage the new moms to sink into and appreciate because, you know, we, we have to take this whole COVID mess as the, the whole package, right? Yeah, indeed. And I, I do like the silver lining of families coming together in unique and powerful ways that wasn't really happening before. So Absolutely. That, that, is, that is good. Well, so tell me, you've been doing this for a couple of years now. What's your favorite part of the process? What, what moment do you love or what, what aha experience do you, do you love to do? I love the moment when 
in the online course. So it's all text-based, like people are writing back and forth to each other. And I love that moment when somebody says, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only person feeling that way. And I've just been shown that 50 other people in this course are feeling the same way. And it's just really that, that sense of me too, the sense of I got this. I also really sort of get chills when I find out that someone from the course has started a working parent group at her own office. I've sort of, I, I was a, a serial founder of a couple of working parent groups, both at my past employer and at my current law firm. And I've, the, the course and taking the course has inspired a number of people to really go out and start their own uh, supportive communities within their employers. And so to know that I have like this whole cadre of employers who now have working parent support groups because the person got inspired through Mindful Return really gives me goosebumps. That is really cool. I love that ripple effect, right? Yeah. That's yeah. so great. That's so great. Well, so it's so challenging. I mean, COVID or not, just let's just talk about the, the yeah. real nuts and bolts reality. It's so challenging to walk that line between working mother and, or, or that's an oxymoron. You know, people say that's an oxymoron to, <laughs> yeah. to walk that line between business professional or, you know, uh, entrepreneur or whatever, whatever avenue you're living in your professional work life. And combine that with this very slow, low body centered experience of being a new mama. It's, there's yeah. such a contradiction there. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have any wisdom that you've gathered over the years of, of walking both those lives simultaneously. Yeah, I think the first thing that I would note is that the return to work is not an event, it's a process. And I want people to think about it as almost a year long transition. And, you know, there's this concept that, well, one day you're on maternity leave and boom, you're a hundred percent parent. And then the next day, hundred percent, you're back and like, you know, ne'er the twain shall meet and you're back to who you were and blah, blah, blah. And I don't think that's true or accurate. Um, I really advise people to not only be gentle on themselves through the, the transition back, but to make it a transition where possible to phase your child into childcare, to phase yourself back into work. There are a lot of employers who have taken um, good steps in terms of like creating on-ramping policies in order to allow you to come back, you know, maybe 50 or 60% the first month and 80% the second and 100 and sort of easing yourself back into it. I love I think, that. Yeah. And in, in terms of sort of living both, I think the pause between the two worlds in your day can also be really helpful. So for example, before COVID, um, I used to have a commute that involved going on a metro downtown to DC and then having a little walk to my office. And during that walk, I would pause and turn on inside. I would stop off at a park bench or a hotel lobby, like somewhere where no one could find me. No one knew where I was and turn on Insight Timer, my favorite meditation app, and just sit there for five minutes alone and breathe and sort of transition my mind from home work, uh, home like mommy life to that working person self. And so even during COVID, I'm a huge believer in sort of these transition rituals that can help ground us in whatever role we're playing at the moment. So whenever I get up to my home office desk, I now have a ritual of, you know, raising the blinds, making the bed, coming over to my laptop and sort of like pausing and saying, okay, like I'm now transitioning intentionally from the home world to the work world. So building those into the day is really important, I think. Yeah. So the importance of ritual and I've really never heard of a routine like that. So I think it's really interesting. Is that something that came to you organically? Did you, like, how do you come up with these? Is, or is this just a result of women talking to one another in the group, in that space, to figure out something that works and makes the transition easier? I don't know. I think I thought of that particular ritual on my own, but sort of having pieced together advice that I should start using Insight Timer and that I needed to think of how I could transition my brain from work to home and sort of, you know, talking to other new moms to figure out what it is that they do. I don't think I had ever heard of anybody stopping off on the way to work in a hotel 
lobby or a park bench, but I sort of um, yeah. was on the way to work one morning and saw the park bench and was like, man, I need to sit down and just take a break here. <laughs> and yeah. then, you know, I took the five minute break and was like, well, that felt really good. Let me do that again, you know? Yeah, I think one of the hardest things for me personally is to meditate and just, even if it's for five or 10 minutes, it's, it's probably the most difficult thing for me to do. Mm. So yeah, I need to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's challenging. I, I took a, a one-time class at my law firm once called Meditation for Lawyers, and there was a piece of advice that I really appreciated, which was, if you don't have five minutes, sit for four. If you don't have four minutes, sit for three, et cetera, until, like, if you, like, you can manage to sit for a minute, right, and just make sure. a ritual and a habit, and it's, I think, more important that we, like, intentionally take the pause regardless of the fact that our brain's going to go haywire while we're taking it. Um, and, and just like that, pra- just that trying, practice, yeah. yeah, of like gently saying, it's okay. Like whatever happened today in meditation is fine. And I'll come back at it tomorrow. And that muscle is a really good one to build in parenthood in general. Yeah. And I like what you said about transitioning back in, in percentage terms, if I heard you correctly, mm-hmm. I think one of the, the takeaways from the pandemic I'm doing air quotes, by the way, Mm -hmm. um, is that we can work in different ways and still get our work done. So whether it's doing, like I worked with a new mom at one point at a law firm and she wanted to do four tens, you know, come in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, do her 10 hours a day. It gives her Monday. It gives you a long weekend with the baby. I just like that flexibility. And I think we need more of that. So hopefully that will come of this. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a general understanding that, wow, we actually can get stuff done when we're not sitting with our butt in our chair in our office, which is, I think, a remarkable revolution and really important for everyone. I think one thing I struggle with, at least in a billable hour world, as you know, when I was a new parent and throughout working parenthood, is that working parenthood made me infinitely more efficient. And like, I prioritize things a lot better. And I spent a lot less time wasting time on things that didn't matter or office nonsense and whatever and unfortunately in a billable hour world where you know you get compensated based on the number of hours you spend it's a bit of a disincentive to become efficient and really hurts i think the working parents who prioritize efficiency yeah and parenthood makes you more efficient you learn to multitask you become very regimented and scheduled you know, with, but you also have to be flexible too. I think that's life. But some of my friends who have, you know, eight, nine, 10 kids, because I, I have quite a few friends like that. They're the most laid back, calm people ever. <laughs> <laughs> they're not stressed out, you know, and I just, I find it really interesting. And I think it's partly because of what you're saying. You, you find a way to work more efficiently. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, I saw a study once that came out of that. Oh, who is that fantastic uh, author? Oh, she she's the one that calculated the cost of motherhood. Oh, the name of it. The cost of the price of motherhood. Ah. Do you remember that book? No, oh. Emily. Such a fantastic book. Did she write that? Uh, no. The name's not coming to me right now. But the cost, the price of motherhood. She calculated h- how the U.S. GDP would change if we valued breast milk alone, like not even parenting, <laughs> but just the value of breast milk. Uh-huh. Anyway, I saw a study with that about how working mothers, you know, that double meaning, they can do the same amount of work in half the time as the general employer in their practice, in their businesses. And I think they were actually looking at lawyers in the study because like you said, they get so much more efficient. Um, yeah. And so this idea that you should be able to set your own hours as long as you get the work done when you're a new mother is such a, a good idea. But yeah. the reverse can be true, too. In midwifery world, we talk a lot about placenta brain. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've heard this phrase. But there's a study that came out of uh, The Lancet maybe five, six years ago now that showed that on average, newly postpartum women are about 500,000 brain cells less than when they were <laughs> pre-pregnancy. They do return, but it takes about three years for this regenerative growth 
to happen. And of course it happens with new neural pathways and all this new intelligence and this amazing new process. But it also creates this feeling in a lot of new moms we talk to about like forgetfulness and like feeling lost and like totally spacey and these different things they use and we call it placenta brain and midwifery. I'm wondering what, what do you do to counsel people in that scenario? Yeah, so uh, we have to sort of hold these two concepts, I think, lightly and perhaps together. One that right now you're going to have your brain be functioning a little bit differently. And I, I truly experience how sleep deprivation plays into that. And so there, the advice that I give is really around being gentle to, to yourself, being aware that other people probably aren't noticing as much as you are. You know, I had a, a boss comment on, you know, how elegant, elegantly I was handling working parenthood. And, you know, to me, I was like, I have a ponytail in and I have spit up on me and like elegant is not the word, but she thought I was doing great. So, you know, I think we tend to be a lot harder on ourselves than other people are on us. And then the other thing that I like to do is to give people the longer view and say like, look, over time, parenthood is absolutely the best training ground for leadership. And I encourage brand new parents to to think about and to write down the skills that they're gaining through parenthood that are going to be applicable in the workplace. And those skills might be things like efficiency. It might be the ability to communicate with people who can't actually explain their needs very well to you and, you know, be able to meet those needs. Like the empathy <laughs> muscles, all those things that, like, if we think about the people who are really wonderful leaders in the world and who we admire as leaders, the skills that we admire about them are the things that parenthood gives us. So I try to reframe the conversation for them to give them some hope. That's awesome. That's a brilliant, brilliant suggestion. And of course, one of the most prominent working mothers has been the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda, who not only took office and then went through a whole pregnancy, labor, delivery, breastfeeding on the Senate floor and all those amazing things that she's done, but continued to, to um, now run a campaign for re-election and do all these things while being working mother. And it's, it's pretty awesome. And managing a global pandemic in a way that, uh, right. you know, and was then there's far that. exceeding all the other uh, male yeah. leaders. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> exactly. Then there's that. Yeah, that's been fun to see. It is possible. But then there's this whole, I, I, I don't really want to have invite a major debate, but I do want to acknowledge the controversy that is in the United States around the real debate that's been decades long now about staying home versus going back to work. And this challenge, this frustration, this almost like like war in camps in some way. In fact, I think Pampers did this really fantastic advertisement about how we're all just parenting the best that we can. It, you know, made its way into pop culture so completely that's in ads. But, but I wonder, there, are, there must be parents that come to you really personally hung up about this almost moral dilemma that exists in our society. And I'm sure that many of our listeners have struggled with this. I did myself. I mean, I consider myself, you know, very supportive of, of full-time parenting and, and, and loved it. And yet I have worked my entire life. I, I worked through all my, my baby's lives. I happened to have them with me some of the time and juggled, you mm -hmm. know, partners and, you know, do all the things that we can do to spend as much time as we can with our kids. But I personally you know, in, in evaluating this could not be the full-time stay-at-home mother that a lot of people argue for. And, and then I also know stay-at-home mothers who are literally bored to tears and can't wait, you know, can't wait to go back. And then I see the reverse where it's like uh, working mothers are exhausted and overwhelmed and feel like they have four jobs and all these things. And I, I wonder, I, I know you deal with it sensitively, but I'm wondering if you could kind of speak to this not even the cultural debate, but the internal debate or the, the way that we've internalized this judgment of working mothers? And, and how, do you, how do you counsel people who are struggling with this? Yeah, so you've packed a lot in there, Augustine. I'm I know, to figure I'm out sorry. which part to tease. It's all good. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you ended with probably what is the big G word, the guilt. I think since I have become a working parent, since I become a parent, the Teddy Roosevelt quote, comparison is the thief of joy, has been my mantra daily. And I think for many people, it's really that deep soul searching about what makes sense for them, what makes sense for their family, for their own 
desires and passions in the world? Um, that's, that's not an easy answer. It's not an answer, right? It's look inside yourself and you'll figure out what you want to do that, that, doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem. I hate the mommy war construct. I heard someone say the other day that there is no such thing as stay at home or working mom because she's the same woman. And in fact, she's probably the same woman just in different moments of her, you know, um, seasons of her life, right? And so I don't and think- And it's we... all predicated on this idea that our, our country, our government, our culture doesn't have space for, for financially for women to safely stay home, right? Like there's this whole other level to it. Yeah. yeah. And I think during COVID, this issue has been really highlighted and there's a lot of talk about women dropping out of the workforce because they're just not able to get any support regardless of um, whether they want to continue to work or not. And so I think it's an issue that's sort of coming up and getting highlighted again in a new way. In terms of, well, a couple of things. I've had women say to me who have been out of the workforce for a while, if I had only had a supportive community to return to and had resources in place like your course and like a manager who got it, I don't know that I would have left because I would have felt more comfortable, more supported. There might have been an on-ramp. It might not have been an all or nothing decision. And I've had women say to me, you know, I was really on the fence about whether or not to go back. But when I saw the examples of other people doing it and supporting each other through it, then, you know, I felt more comfortable about doing the thing that I wanted to do anyway. So I feel like um, finding those supportive communities is helpful. Just speaking as someone who, you know, my husband and I are both working for pay and we have children in school. I do get frustrated personally sometimes when our school makes statements or plans scheduled things that presume that there is one person home with a child and not working. So, you know, the other day we're in remote school land, they said it was like a Tuesday and they said, okay, tomorrow everyone needs to come between nine and three to pick up all the workbooks for your children for the, the school year. And there are like issues around sensitivity to the fact that you might have two parents working from nine to three that fail to come through in those instances. But, um, you know, I, I really do feel like we are all parents doing the best to raise our kids and we all need to support one another regardless of what we call ourselves on a given day as to working or not. Yeah, exactly. Well, I've heard a really good reframe that's like, we're all working. It's yes. just some are working in the home and some are working out of the home exactly. and some are doing both. Yeah, you know? yes. yeah. yeah absolutely. I, I love that answer. Thank you for, for clarifying. And, and yeah, the word was mommy wars. That's what I was looking for. But it's yeah. so infantile. It's so infantile. Like, infant, <laughs> it is. what's that word? Yeah. It, it, I don't know. It cheapens. Yeah, it does. I also want to... Yeah. Um, maybe just make a comment about the fact that caregiving is so devalued in our country that right. you know, that is a serious problem. And I think it also really affects, I'm going to come back again to women's ability to succeed in the workplace because male caregiving is not valued. And it, there have been studies linking longer paternity leaves to more successful careers for the mom. And so to the extent we shame dads for caregiving and for taking the time to bond with a baby and all that sort of thing, the more we're hurting the moms out there too. Yep. Which is, we're back at <laughs> fighting the patriarchy. Yes. Well, I, <laughs> it always comes back to that, doesn't it? Oh, it does. Well, I wonder in your experience in writing this course content, researching this topic, starting to present it out there, when you were reflecting on your experience, what was the hardest part and how did that differ from what, like you're pretty far away from the transition back to parenting. Yes. You've got kiddos that <laughs> yes. are school age, right? Yes. So looking back after creating all this content um, and helping however many hundreds of families that have come through your process now, what do you remember thinking was going to be the hardest part versus what do you know now really was? Um, in terms of uh, sort of like living life as an entrepreneur and a mother and a lawyer, I probably presumed that the hardest part was going to be maintaining a legal career while also um, running a company. And I have found to my delight that those things really complement each other. And for me, I'm really thrilled not to be a lawyer 24 seven. I don't think I'd be happy doing that. Um, uh -huh. And looking back, I find that like having an outlet for 
creativity and mentoring and connection actually revitalizes me and having an like an outlet for intellectual stimulation and problem solving on the legal side nourishes and invigorates the other part of my life. And so I probably early on thought that I was going to have to choose one or the other. And it's been really reassuring to see that I can still do both in a way that, you know, fulfills me professionally. It is exciting. And I've heard that that is another kind of solution mm -hmm. that, that parents are coming up with is these split jobs where um, one parent, not necessarily co-parenting people that are married or together, but like two new parents will split one job down the, ha down the middle so that the job will be full, but they'll be both doing part-time. Yeah, you heard of this? I have heard of it. I recently read an article about, I, I believe it was a company in Australia where the two, there were two CEOs running a company. Yeah. They were two moms and they both, you know, split their time half and half. And that says to me that there's no reason why, yeah. I mean, if CEOs of a major company can do it, like we can all figure out that split, right? Um, Absolutely. And I also just want to point out that like, it seems to be a lot more common these days to have a more portfolio approach to one's career where you're not spending 100% of the time doing one job, um, but yeah. rather you're, you know, building all the different pieces of what define a career for you. And I love that about the, the society that we're evolving into. Totally. Can I pick your brain and go off on a little tangent for a sure. second? Because mm -hmm. you have something that like I talk a lot about with mom, with moms about is this, what we call the side hustle, Yes, <laughs> which is, is making a living, finding a sustainable pathway, following a passion and making money on the side. Um, tell us a little bit about what that's been like for you and, and do you recommend it? Yeah. So I actually read that um, there, w there was a study done about like the happiness levels of people who have started a side hustle. And I think it can be um, an outlet that can help you feel more recharged in your day job if you're also doing something on the side that really invigorates you. For me, I mean, it, it lights me up. It's that thing that I couldn't help myself but to do. I think in terms of advice on that front, I think it's really like, what is that thing that you would do even if no one were paying you, right? And ideally, what is that, that thing that is allowing you to use some parts of your brain and the, the passions that you have that you don't get to channel in other ways during your day? I think in terms of advice, like take the long view. Take that, like, I'm not going to accomplish everything in the side hustle tomorrow because I also have kids and I also have another job, et cetera. Um, but just to be patient with yourself and to realize that, like, the journey of a thousand steps, a uh, thousand miles has begun with a single step. And that if you do a little tiny bit on that passion project, call it 20 minutes a day, call it an hour a week, whatever that is, you're moving the needle towards something that over time is going to really um, be able to grow and build. You know, pick something that is, is that thing, that, the problem you wish to see solved in society, right? Love it. I love it. Yeah, I feel the same way. Well, this has been just so exciting to hear about the solutions that you created. I'm wondering if we can go a little deeper into the solutions, answering that kind of perennial question we talk about in every episode, which is how do we help mothers with health, education, love, and protection? And tell me more about what your offering does to kind of check those boxes. Yeah, so I love those four buckets and I'll um, counter with the four buckets of my own that are sort of built into the Mindful Return program that I think sort of align nicely. Uh, with the themes that you're talking about here. Um, when I was planning the Mindful Return course and when I was thinking about going back, I said, wow, had I focused on these four things, I would have had a much more successful transition back to work. And the first um, is a mindful mindset for going back. So really how to get our heads in a better place. And this is the mental health piece, really. Um, the second piece is really all about the logistics of returning and getting those pearls of wisdom from other people who have been there, done that on how to make your day run, how to pick a childcare provider, how to, you know, negotiate flexibility with your employer, all the logistical tactics. Transport stuff. breast milk. All of that. <laughs> yes, things. exactly. Right, yeah. um, the third piece is about leadership in the space of return. And that's where I really focus on transitioning the mindset from, oh, you know, now that I have a kid, I'm just not worth worthy at the office to, no, I'm actually gaining these leadership skills and learning how to delegate. And the, these things are really important. And then the fourth piece that I focus on is building community and staying in community and making sure that you are loved and nurtured and supported throughout your working parent journey um, so that you're not feeling like you have to go through it alone and winding up crying on the kitchen floor like I did for way too long. 
Mm. Oh, yeah. and so many do. It's such a hard thing. Or, or they, they leave. They yeah. leave their their exactly. positions, which is a, a massive loss. Not only to that, the livelihood, the the creativity, the joy, but actually loss of income. And then there's been some interesting studies about the IQ of children whose parents leave work for them versus those mm-hmm. that stay in and all those sorts of things. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. I, I guess I want to sort of wind up our conversation by bringing Keisha back in. You have talked in other podcasts and other times about the challenge of being a single mom. And I wonder if we could sort of chat about that today. I, I was a single mom for a number of years myself, and that's a whole nother kind of challenge in returning to work. And I'm wondering if we can just sort of unpack some solutions or some commiserate on some challenges or what's there. Yeah, that's a loaded question. Uh, it is, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't ask it very specifically either. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. Um, well, you know, I've been single for a little while now, but then in the beginning, I worked for myself. So I had that flexibility. And then only recently have I started working like a real deal 40 hour a week job, probably for the first time in a decade. So it was a huge adjustment. And it's just the logistics of it, right? Like, okay, I have to leave the house at this time in order to drop off. Will they do early drop off? Oh, no, they won't. Oh, yeah, it's COVID. So now we're switching schools entirely and just getting to work on time. And, you know, I've had to, I think outsourcing a lot of stuff is good. And I know for a long time, I didn't want to have someone come clean my house for whatever reason. I just felt like I should be able to do that. Well, you know, I came to my senses and I'll pay anybody to do anything for me if I have the resources. So I have to have someone pick up my son I have someone come clean the house every couple weeks, you know, so I think it's about really planning, trying to get support where you can. If you have family close by, great. I never have had that really. Um, So then it's a matter of making connections and just asking around and, you know, you never know who you can find who will, will help you. You know, and there's lots of good online resources for finding help, too. Like lots of good websites, lots of good Facebook groups. And I've just kind of had to look into every possible resource under the sun. Laura, do you have any extra advice in this category? No. Well, I was just going to say that I had a huge mental battle with having someone come and clean the house too. And I, I'm not quite sure why, but it seems to be a common struggle for many of us. I also- It goes like, back to that guilt thing, right? Like we're supposed yeah. to be able to do it all. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. And like Keisha, I got over it. And you know, then during COVID, we had a couple of months where we just weren't bringing anyone in. And once I heard that Dr. Anthony Fauci was bringing his housekeeper back, then I was like, go for it. You know, they're, they're coming back. So yeah, just definitely echo that, that concept of really finding communities where you can get support from other people, you know, regardless of their situation, but also people who are very similarly situated to you. There are a number of single moms by choice who are coming through the Mindful Return course. And I know that they've found a lot of solace in finding one another just because they have a little bit of a different path often. And, um, you know, just knowing that there are communities out there that they can join can be really reassuring. It really is. Community is what brings us all together. Belonging, that sense mm-hmm. of belonging, mm-hmm. it, it, it eases so, so much. Well, what a fun conversation. What a fun topic to come up with solutions for this really challenging time in, in most, most birthing people's lives. It's like figuring out what next. And if they, if they make money outside of the home, there are very few resources. So we're excited to highlight yours. Thank you so much for joining us today. Will you tell us how people can find your information? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on, Augustine and Keisha. I loved our conversation as well. You can find more at www.mindfulreturn.com. There's information there about all the various courses, and I have a blog and a weekly newsletter called Saturday Secrets that comes out every Saturday morning. Um, I'm on all the usual social media places. You can find you know, me at Mindful Return over on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And I wrote a book called Back to Work After Baby, How to Plan and Navigate a Mindful Return from Maternity Leave that you can find on Amazon. Oh, cool. Thank you. We're going to link to all of that in the show notes. 
And just a, a big thank you, not only for this conversation, but for what you're doing for, for people in the world. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you are all, yeah, all doing you. as well. Creating community and helping new moms is uh, so, 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 so important. It really, really is. Well, here's to more help for mothers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.